Hey, One Thing for Men, it is good to be back in the saddle again. Listen, One Thing for Men, our mission, our vision, our passion is to spur men on to walk with God. And we're going to do that by beginning a brand new study today with uh, a focus on the life of David. It's a character study of King David. After all, uh, David was uh, the only man, or woman for that matter, in all of the scriptures whom, of whom it was ever said that he was a man after God's own heart. You know, more is written about David in the Old Testament than is written, some 66 chapters, not including anything in the book of Psalms, than is written about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Elijah all put together. In the New Testament, David is the most commonly referred to person from the Old Testament. I believe some 59 references. David had some incredible successes in life, but he also had some awful, dismal failures. But through it all, through the ups and the downs, David distinguished himself as a real man of God. And when we look at David's lineage, we look at his heritage, if you will, we learn a lot about why David turned out the way he did. And in order for us to be able to understand that backstory, we have to go to the Old Testament book of Ruth. So I want to encourage you to be finding your way in your Bible, on your device or your phone, however you study along with us, to the Old Testament book of Ruth. Ruth. The book of Ruth is basically an appendix to the book of Judges. The book of Ruth, or the book of Judges, is really all about the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel between the times of Joshua and Samuel, about 350 years. It takes place approximately 1350 B.C. all the way down to about 1000 B.C. And what the book of Judges tells us is, is that during that time period in Israel's history, nobody was really listening to God at all. As a matter of fact, the very last verse, chapter 21 and verse 25 says this, and I quote, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that kind of summarizes that epoch, that time period, if you will, in the life of the nation of Israel. Spiritual decline and decadence was the rule of the day in the nation of Israel. Yet against this backdrop, the book of Ruth is like a shining star on a moonless night. In, the, in this book, we meet people who actually did walk with God, who did pay attention to God's leading and leadership, even amongst the spiritual decline and decadence that was going on all around him. So join me if you would, Ruth chapter 1 and verse number 1. We read these words. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. Now what's interesting is, is the word Malon means weakly and Chilion means sickly. So here are their two sons, weakly and sickly. They were Ephrites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Now, this is a tragic situation, to be quite honest with you. They move because of the famine. They go to Moab. All of a sudden, after a period of time, Naomi's husband dies. Over a period of about 10 years while living there, both of her sons died. They had taken wives, and now we have basically three women without any husbands uh, in the picture whatsoever. Now, word comes to Naomi that there is finally now, the famine has released, there's food in Israel once again. So she makes the decision that she's going to go back to her homeland, back to Bethlehem. And her two daughter-in-laws are about to go with her. Uh, after they start on this journey, uh, Naomi's thinking to herself, you know what, girls, this is not a good idea. Uh, you don't need to go back to a foreign land. You need to take care of yourselves. You need to stay in your homeland of, of Moab. 
you really shouldn't do this. It, it wouldn't be a good thing to do. As a matter of fact, uh, there's no welfare system uh, in uh, Israel. There's no uh, programming for assistance that will take care of widows without sons or husbands. And uh, there's nothing that that's going to really be there to benefit you. Chances are you're not even going to have a the ability to find a husband there. And so she strongly encourages them to stay. And the next thing we see is that one of her daughter-in-laws, Orpah, makes a decision. You know what? You're right. I'm going to stay put. But follow along with me and let's look what Ruth did beginning here in verse 14 of Ruth chapter 1. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Now, this was a very courageous thing that Ruth did. This was a very compassionate thing that Ruth did. She put the needs and the interests of her mother-in-law ahead of her own needs and interests. And by doing this, really what she was doing is she was settling in for a life of financial hardship. She was going to be ostracized as a foreigner in Naomi's homeland of Israel. She was really locking herself into a life of serving her age aging mother-in-law. But Ruth voluntarily embraced this. And she said, I am committed to my mother-in-law. I am not going to leave her. And I'm not going to focus just on my own needs, but I'm going to focus on her. And I got a question at this particular point. All mother-in-law jokes aside, would you do that for your mother-in-law? That takes a great deal of commitment. Ruth honored God in what she did. As a matter of fact, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12 says this, honor your father and your mother. If you know that's a part of the 10 commandments, that's actually the fourth commandment. And it can certainly uh, be uh, carried over to your mother-in-law too. Ruth was a woman who made a decision to honor God with her life. Now look with me, if you will, at Ruth chapter 1, verse 22. We pick up the story, and we're going to read on through to chapter 2 and verse 3. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Chapter 2, verse 1 says this, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of, the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go my daughter. So she went, set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, we got to stop here for a second. got to talk about this issue of gleaning. Gleaning was a cultural practice that was established by God uh, to provide for the poor people, for the orphans, for the widows, people just like Ruth and Naomi. Uh, we read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 19, in which it says, where you reap your harvest, when you reap your harvest in your field, and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. You, it shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. In other words, what God established, what God told his people was this. When you harvest your fields, if some grain falls to the ground, if you miss an ear here or there as you are harvesting, don't go back and re-harvest it. Let it stay there. Don't pick it up. The people uh, like Ruth could then come along, follow the harvesters, pick up enough grain that was left on the ground to eke out a meager existence. And here's what God was basically saying. He said, if you'll do that, if you will honor me in this way, I will give you back far more than you left behind 
on the ground. Now, not everyone in the nation of Israel did that. In fact, many times in the Bible, you see God condemning people because they didn't do that, because the basic truth is, is they were greedy. They wanted everything that was coming to them. But there was a guy by the name of Boaz. He was a godly man who made the decision, I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to honor God. And he let people come and glean in the fields after them. And then watch what happens next in this story. Ruth chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaths after the reapers. Now, what is interesting here is this. It just so happened that Ruth was gleaning in Boaz's field. And it just so happened that at this exact time, Boaz comes out to the country to check on the progress of the work happening in his fields. And it just so happens that Boaz noticed Ruth. And it just so happens that in his heart, it skipped a beat. And it actually says in the Hebrew, these words, he said to himself when he saw her, va, 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 voom. Now, it doesn't really say that, but, but that's really the picture of what's happening here. Uh, and, it, and it just so happened that Ruth noticed him too. You see, when God is in something, it is amazing how much just happens, isn't it? Uh, so they end up falling in love and eventually getting married. But do you know what really, what really caused Boaz's heart to connect with Ruth? It wasn't just because Ruth was a beautiful woman, but he was also impressed by Ruth. He was impressed by her character, by her work ethic, by her discipline, and by her devotion. She was not afraid of hard work. Look at what it says, Ruth chapter 2 and verse 7. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. In other words, she knew what hard work was and she was a hard working woman. He was also impressed with her loyalty and her devotion to care for her mother-in-law. It says in Ruth chapter 2 verses 10 and 11, they fell, she, then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, this is Ruth saying to Boaz, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. He was also impressed with her commitment to God and her love for the God of Israel. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 12 says, the, re the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz not only fell in love with Ruth, but he married Ruth because she was a Proverbs 31 woman before there was ever a Proverbs 31. Uh, she was a woman of devotion. She was a woman of loyalty. She was a woman who had a great spiritual commitment to the God of Israel. And because he was a distant relative of her deceased husband, he was allowed to marry her and he did just that. Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, we read these words. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Now, we'll slide down to verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid it on her lap and became his nurse. Verse 17. And the, woman, and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here we have Ruth and Boaz, two people who made a commitment to honor God. She, by staying faithful to care for 
her mother-in-law, he, by doing exactly what God said and, and leaving the grains and the sheaves in the field for those who were coming behind it to glean. They met, they fell in love, they got married, and they established a family. But not just any family, they established a family in which God was priority one. It was a God-honoring family. And they had a son who in turn honored God, who then had a son who honored God, who then had a son who honored God, who became the greatest king in the nation of Israel's history. It was not by accident. David just didn't arise out of a spiritual vacuum. David, a man after God's own heart, didn't just happen. But David had a godly heritage, a godly history, a godly legacy that went all the way back to his great-grandmother and his great-grandfather who honored God and put God first in their lives. And if you really want to know the secret, how was it that David ended up being the man that he did? All you have to do is go back and look at his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather and his great-grandmother, and you will see the seeds were planted for David to become the man that he was. The lesson then for us to take away that we can learn from David and Boaz and Ruth's story is that healthy, happy, holy, God-honoring children and grandchildren has everything to do with our personal walk with God. It has everything to do with our living and authentic Christian faith before our families every day. It has everything to do with the choices we make, that we choose to love God and we choose to obey His Word. It has everything to do with the choices is the spiritual choices that we make every single day. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 8 through 10 says this, you shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 9, you shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, question, what is God telling us here? Well, God's trying to tell us that the way you and I live today has ramifications long after we're dead and gone. That generations from now, your descendants, my descendants are going to feel the impact of the decisions and the choices we make today in the way we live and the lifestyle that we choose. And God's promised here in Deuteronomy 5, his promise can either be a tremendous blessing or a tremendous curse, depending on the choices that you and I make today. I mean, look at Ruth, look at Boaz, look at David, the, the, the heritage, the godly heritage that they provided for him was a huge blessing. Boaz and Ruth both made choices that we see passed down that honored God to their great grandson, David, four generations later. God honored his word. He did exactly what he said he would do here in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now, that's not just a truth for Bible times. It is a truth for our day and our age as well. So, if you're a part of, of what we're doing today, and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior, that decision has far, far further ranging uh, implications than just your life here and now in eternity. It, it affects generations to follow you, your, your family down the road. And so if you've never trusted in Jesus as your real and personal Savior, the first step to providing a godly heritage and, and a, a, a godly legacy, if you will, is to come to know Jesus as your real and personal Savior. It's to admit that you're a sinner and that your sin has separated you from God, that you will believe that Jesus was who he said he was and that he did what he said that he came to do, and then that you would confess your sin and say, God, I cannot save myself. My sin has separated me from you. As best I know how, I confess I can't do it on my own. My sin has separated me from you. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Come into my life. That's the greatest single decision you could ever possibly make to get your relationship with God made right. That begins the process then of building a godly heritage and legacy for the generations to follow as you live for and choose to live for Jesus Christ every single day.
Now, with all of that story said, how can we take practical steps today to affect positively the generations that follow us. Let me give you four things in closing that you can do to be a blessing to the generations to come. Just four practical steps. Step number one is this, stay married for life. Stay married for life. Now, I know what some are saying. You're saying, well, well, Hutch, I've already blown that, so why should I even try? Well, listen, you start afresh. You start, you start today. You start from that relationship that you're in now or that relationship that you soon will enter into and you make a commitment to make that marriage last for the rest of your life. I gotta be honest with you, Cindy and I have been married for over 34 years now and it has not always been a honeymoon. It has been some very rough, some very rocky seas, but uh, we have made the commitment that divorce was never going to be an option. Murder was always on the table, but we never followed through on that. But divorce was just something that, that we didn't joke about. It wasn't something that we talked about. It was, it was off the table for us. And by God's grace, we've made it 34 plus years. And by God's grace, we will see that through as life partners till death separates us or we both go home to be with the Lord. But that is a, a, a foundation for a godly heritage. Stay married for life. Number two, live an authentic life before your family now. Live an authentic Christian life before your family now. In other words, Take the principles of the Word of God that you know, that you've learned, that you've studied, that you've heard preached, that you've taught to your children, and implement them regularly on your lives. You know, let those who know you best know the true, genuine character of your heart. Don't try to cut corners. Don't try to get by with whatever you can. But live as God honoring as you can. And listen, when you blow it, and I have blown it so many times, so many times I've had to go back and ask my children to forgive me because I have blown it. What you're modeling for them is an authenticness that we all blow it from time to time. Number three, make choices that honor God now. The choices that you make, ask yourself, is this the best choice I could possibly make? How will this impact my life? How will this impact the life of my children? How will this impact the life of my children's children? And I want to make decisions today that honor God. And then fourthly, and this one's going to take a little extra effort to be quite honest with you, be willing to give up your rights that you have now to protect and promote a godly heritage in future generations. In other words, you may have the right, you may have the liberty to do a lot of things in this life, but you got to ask yourself, how will that impact my children, my grandchildren? I have liberties, I have freedoms to do things, but if I do them, what am I doing? What am I setting up the next generation? You know, it's kind of been taught to me through the years that however far I go in sin in my life, my children are going to take it one step further. So I need to guard very carefully the decisions that I make and the way that I live my life today. Now, truth be known, maybe you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, I've already blown it. What's the use? Why even try? Listen, if you didn't come from a godly heritage, make the decision. If you have not been living that God-honoring life to this point, make the decision today, right here, right now. I am going to, by the grace of God, live for the glory of God for the generations that follow behind me. You can do it. You may not be perfect, but hopefully, prayerfully, you are progressing in your personal walk of faith, and the generations to follow will see a man who is growing after God's own heart. And there's no better example that you could set. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the godly heritage that we see in Ruth and Boaz, the great grandmother and the great grandfather of the great king of the nation of Israel, David. We know that it was that promise of Deuteronomy chapter five that was began over in Ruth that followed through into the life of David. And although he didn't live a perfect life, he lived a life that models for us what it means to passionately pursue God, to passionately walk with God, to passionately confess sin when sin arises. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us as we begin this journey to study the character of David, a man after God's own heart, build into each and every one of us the fabric and the fiber necessary so that it can be said of us that we too are men after God's own heart. And may it be for your glory and for our and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren's good. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.